हेलो टीम वेलकम टू माय सेशन ऑन कॉफी विद प्रब एंड टुडे वी गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट सी रिस्क एग्जाम क्रैम डोमेन फॉर इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी एंड सिक्योरिटी द कंटेंट एरिया इन दिस डोमेन विल रिप्रेजेंट अप्रॉक्सीमेटली ट्वेंटी टू परसेंट ऑफ द सी रिस्क एग्जाम सो यू कैन से लाइक दैट थर्टी थ्री क्वेश्चन अप्रॉक्स इज बेसिकली टेस्टेबल फ्रॉम दिस एरिया ओके फ्रॉम दिस डोमेन so i already made the domain 1 domain 2 and domain 3 video so you can check that and i'm planning to make more videos in in future on the series examination so if you new to my channel do subscribe to my youtube channel and click on the bell icon to make sure you should not miss my future videos on a similar topic my name is prab nair for more information you can refer my linkedin profile thank you so when you're talking about the domain 4 domain 4 cover two parts one part is called as a information technology principles now in this section they cover about the basics of it enterprise operations enterprise architecture and all that and the reason of adding this content is because c risk as a certification it's not only done by the it professionals it is also done by the process people or finance people and all that from that point of view they want to give them a visibility about the it and their associate risk so that is why in this part they cover enterprise architecture very high level it operations project management enterprise resiliency very very important which is also called as a bcp along with that they talk about the data life cycle management which include the privacy aspect system development life cycle the phases in the sdlc and emerging trend in the technology which talk about ai blockchain and all that but when you talking about the part b in part b they talk about the information security this is one of my favorite area because when you're talking about the part b they talk about the information security concept they talk about the framework we talk about the awareness trainings effectiveness of the awareness training because human is the weakest link in the organization and that can be mitigated with the help of regular training then along with that they also covered on the data privacy and principle of data protection so we'll start with the part 1 first which is called part a and then we'll discuss the part b okay so part a is information technology principles so in the information technology principles the first part we need to understand about the enterprise architecture okay so what is enterprise architecture so when you're talking about enterprise enterprise is all about ppt pra what is ppt ppt stand for people process and technology and how they are going to work that is depending upon what architecture you have adopted so architecture is just like a blueprint so enterprise is all about the information system people process technology and architecture is all about the layout let's understand in a very simple term this is is your desired state example like you wish to reduce uh, you want to reduce the weight up to 65 kg like you want to reach 65 kg weight and your current weight body weight is basically 90 kg so you want to drive from the current state to desired state now you need a plan right so you need a plan in the plan you need to talk about the workout the food the diet healthy style and all that so that need to be aligned in this particular plan correlate in this particular plan because we need to eat a right food we need to do the right exercise on a right time so we will create a workout plan and in the workout plan we organize all these details so this workout plan is the architecture this workout plan is a blueprint so by following this blueprint you can able to achieve the desired state same like in the organization we are running a different uh technologies we are running a different services and all that in order to correlate all these element we need to use the framework sorry we need to use an architecture same like this is your current it structure okay and this is your business strategy what you need you want to ensure the current it functions and all that it should support the business function so that is why we basically adopt the architecture so by architecture we can able to organize all the process and people all the parameter in a proper sequence by which we can able to achieve my 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 current it to the business requirement so whenever we starting any kind of a strategy in the organization you need to organize the element in a particular parameter that is where we adopt the enterprise architecture same like before building a house you design the blueprint of the house which give you visibility about the placement of window doors and all that so that blueprint is a architecture and according to architecture you achieve 
the transition from a current state to the desired state. So here, if you can see the description, enterprise architecture is a conceptual blueprint that describe the structure and operation of the organization. Okay. And the purpose of enterprise architecture is to determine how the organization can effectively achieve its current and future objectives. But along with that, enterprise architecture also involves the practice of analyzing, planning, designing, eventually implementing of the analysis on an enterprise. Because if we're talking about the overall thing, an environment in which enterprise architecture is either immature or absent. So risk practitioner is effectively forced to place greater emphasis on the use of a technology specific assessment as a mean for building a, a prize mill vision of the current IT risk and evaluation of a risk against the established enterprise architecture therefore yield both greater efficiencies and more completely understand on the risk environment. So I have an example here you can see. So this is called your viewpoint example customer has their own viewpoint business owner has their viewpoint and ICT director has their viewpoint and internal auditor has their viewpoint. Now it is not possible for us as a risk practitioner that okay we can able to mitigate or address all the risks. So before going to drive that we need to understand all their context. So whenever we are building any kind of a solution in the organization we need to understand their uh, you know perspective and that is called as a contextual layer. Then, then based on that, we basically build the conceptual where we're talking about governability, usability, maintainability, security, and based on that, we introduce the control objectives. And then on the logical layer, which is the operation level, we introduce the security strategy, standards, pattern, and everything. So what is this? This is overall is called as an enterprise architecture. So by adopting this enterprise architecture, we can able to organize the things in detail. And what is the role of a risk practitioner? Risk practitioner goal is to evaluate the risk, identify risk in this enterprise architecture. Why? So that we need to ensure this enterprise architecture is aligned with our company's objectives, business objective and strategy. So that is how it basically works. Let's move to the next part. See, when you're talking about as a IT operation, it is all about running an operation to support the business. So as a risk practitioner, okay, is not expected or required to be a technical expert in the design, implementation or support of individual IT system or application. However, the strong knowledge of general IT concept is invaluable for anyone whose roles and responsibility required close and ongoing interaction with the IT staff. Is it clear? So here when we can, we can see we have a hardware. Okay, in hardware, we're talking about the supply chain management. So in the recent year, there has been several example of the hardware, which is intentionally infected with the security vulnerability during the manufacturing or delivering of the services. Example, if you can see Huawei, which was banned in US. There's a lot of companies who basically imbibed a malware in their product and they sell to the customer. And then we are using that infected system or infected hardware in our organization, which can become a later a biggest threat for the company. So as a risk practitioner, we need to check from that aspect because that breaches have been found on a network devices, point of sales terminals, applications, smartphones from a numerous countries and vendor. However, such vulnerabilities are easy to detect are not easy to detect. So risk practitioner uh, should be aware of the risk of purchasing an infected equipments and also encourage their organization to use trusted vendors or supplier whenever is possible. So purchasing equipment that has been tested or evaluated by some external standards. So one of the standard we basically use is common criteria, which is called as a 15408 standard. So whenever we uh, buy any kind of a product, we will check is the product pass the common criteria certification. And that is called as a 15408. So as I said, as a risk practitioner, uh, you know, you don't want to be pro in all the things, but you just need to understand the high level, how things works, how protocol works, what is cabling, what is repeater, what is switches, what is router, what is firewall, DNS and wireless point, and also need to understand what is the risk associated with this area. So one example is we need to understand the risk uh, coming from an operating system, the risk basically associated with the application, database, software utility, environmental control is another example we have. So when you're talking about the environmental control, we have a different type of environmental control, like example, HVAC system, fire extinguishers, what are the risks associated with this area, 
protection against natural disaster and all that make sure they have a appropriate control to reduce the impact so as a risk practitioner you need to have that level of understanding in the environmental control now when it come to the network area like we have a different kind of protocol so protocol is a set of rule by which we communicate right now i'm using english as a as a protocol by which i'm communicating in this session cabling a media by which we transfer the data so we have a different type of cabling we have a fiber optic we have a twisted pair fiber optic is basically better than twisted pair in terms of the data sensitive data sensitivity and we also use from the speed point of view repeater is a device that is used to amplify the signals example we have a system a we have a system b so whenever the data a is sending to b signal is go like that so signal is dip here so we amplify the signal to boost the signal so this device we are using to amplify the signal that is called as a repeater then we talk about the switches switches is a device that is used to connect the multiple systems then we have a router router is a device which is used to connect the two different network then firewall is a device which is used to protect against the external attacks dns is a service which is used to translate name to ip and ip to name along with that wireless points are we are basically using for connecting the uh, wifi connections and all that so we would like to understand the risk associated with all these areas and you also need to know what are the countermeasures not in a detail but at least on a high level because as a risk practitioner you need to address the risk on the network area also now when you're talking about in a it operations one new element which is added recently in the new syllabus of series was a virtualization and cloud computing so if you're talking about uh, before starting about the virtualization and uh, cloud computing let me first discuss about the network topology network topology so topology is all about the layout of the network before installing any network we design the network we design the layout of the network and that is basically called as a network topology and we have a different type of network topology like we have a bus topology we have a ring topology we have a star topology so these are some topologies we have we would like to understand the risk associated with the topologies example like uh, in the case of bus topology okay so we have a system a we have a system b and we have a system c all three systems are basically connect with the same cable now and the concern here is that if the cable is down all the connection is basically down so that is a risk associated with the bus topology in the case of ring topology sorry star topology we have a switch here and all the devices are basically connected with the switch if switch is down everything is basically down so that is how you need to understand the risk associated with the topologies then the second is basically called as a demilitarized zone demilitarized zone we basically create in the organization by which we can able to protect my internal network from the external network how let me explain you so this is my internet here okay here we have a firewall one and then we basically create a one network here and then we have another firewall and uh, then we have a uh, another network so here the point is we basically keep those host okay we keep those host in this particular network which is basically providing a public facing communication example web server smtp server email server dns server we keep those servers in the dmz which is providing the service to the internet because if i basically give too much security on the firewall it impact the traffic performance because it was introduced to offer a service to my client over the internet so we will have a limited rule in this firewall and we will have a more restricted rule in this firewall we can keep those systems in the internal network which basically have a critical and sensitive servers is it clear so according to that so that is why we introduce the dmz so this is a network which is basically used to create so that i can able to protect my internal network directly from the internet okay so to that is a thing okay the next thing is basically called as a vpn virtual private network virtual private network is a technology which is used by people by which they connect to the enterprise network from anywhere the ultimate goal of vpn is to protect the data over the internet so it's creating a tunnel through which we basically send the data from one location to other location so example i am working from home 
so i cannot send random data of my sensitive data over the internet on the public channel and all that because anyone can able to intercept that so vpn used to create a unique channel from my laptop to the enterprise server and through that particular channel we able to send the data in a secure manner so that is basically called as a vpn now coming to the point is virtualization and cloud computing so when you're talking about virtualization so let me first explain you what is virtualization it is used to creating a virtual system in a one hardware we can able to create a multiple virtual system depending upon the capability in one hardware so this is the one hardware we have so we simply install the one os and then on top of it we install the applications but might be i need to run multiple os so this is the system we have in which i will install the os and then i will basically install the vmware workstation and then i'm able to create a multiple virtual machine so by this way i can able to utilize multiple system in one particular hardware and by this way i can able to fully utilize my hardware for my business objective so we have a two type of virtualization actually so one is basically called type 1 and one is basically called as a type 2 so in the type 1 what happen is this is the hardware and on top of the hardware we basically install the esxi and then i'm creating a virtual machine but in the type 2 we have a hardware then i will install the os which can be microsoft linux and then on top of it i'm installing the virtual machine vmware workstation and then i'm creating a machines so type 2 is basically less secure the reason is very simple because if uh the type 2 is less secure reason why is because along with the vm there we are running some other applications also so a hacker can basically exploit this application from there he can able to access a vm and from there he can able to access a multiple machines but in the type 1 as a security professional i need to protect the esx only so by protecting esx i can able to protect all the machine so reason of introducing a virtualization is we can able to fully utilize my hardware for my business objectives so cloud computing is a new topic okay cloud computing mean everything is hosted on the cloud and you can able to access the service from anywhere that is basically called as a cloud computing so in a cloud we have a two important thing one is basically called as a service model and one is basically called as a deployment model when you're talking about the service model we have a three type of service model one is called as a saas one is called as a pass and one is called as a ias but in the case of deployment model we basically have a four type of deployment one is basically called public cloud one is called as a private cloud one is called as a community cloud and one is basically called as a hybrid cloud so these are basically the four type of deployment model we have so if we take example of the infrastructure as services in that we get a virtual server you can say we are paying for we are they are rented me a cpu ram and storage now i can deploy anything on top of it i can deploy any os and i can deploy any application i can run any application i just need to pay for how much i consume the ram cpu and storage that is basically called as a infrastructure services second is called as a platform as a services in a platform as services i am least bother about the os and all that i just need a platform on which my team can develop the application that is the only thing so that is called as a platform as a services and third is called as a software as services where everything developed by vendor and they will basically provide me the access of the interface and it is basically based on a subscription based model the best example of the ias is the aws instance and all that the best example of pass is azure inst azure um, this uh, azure app functions and all that and the saas best example is your gmail youtube go to meeting webex office 365 everything was developed by them we just buying us interface and we just pay for the per user account so in assas we have a limited control in the iaas we have a more control one more important thing you need to understand in the cloud is that in a cloud computing okay in a cloud computing we need to understand two aspect one the data security so when you're talking about the data security and compliance data security and compliance okay it is a responsibility of the cloud provide cloud customer and when you're talking about the physical security 
ओके इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर सिक्योरिटी इट इज़ अ रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी ऑफ द क्लाउड प्रोवाइडर सो लेट्स एक एग्जाम्पल दिस इज द बैंक वी हैव बैंक हैज डिसाइडेड टू होस्ट द सर्विस ऑन द क्लाउड सो बैंक हैज डिसाइडेड टू होस्ट अ सर्विस on the cloud so this is the cloud we have okay so they uh, decided to host the data application okay on the cloud so we have a customer here customer came to bank customer provide the details and bank basically store the data in the cloud so even there is a security breach occur from the cloud provider point of view it is a bank who answerable to customer it is a bank who answerable to regulatory authority so no matter what security breach happen on the cloud it is a bank who answerable to the customer okay so you can transfer the responsibility but you still own the accountability of the operation so cloud computing has many advantage however it also create a risk one area of concern is that cloud data center are exceptionally protected and they are also exceptionally tempting target because all the data are consolidated in that server so attackers targeting those servers and all that the live example in the past there's a lot of attack ha happen against the aws and all that and because of that it disrupt major services on the internet or on the world so cloud data center are exceptionally protected but they are vulnerable for multiple attacks enterprise should understand where the data may reside okay where the data may be physically stored because that determines the jurisdiction for purpose of privacy and regulations so risk practitioner whose organization are considering a migration of infrastructure to the cloud they should keep in mind that this is the business decision however outsourcing of any sort of form of uh, outsourcing of any sort in a form of risk transfer it cannot fully transfer the risk should the organization data be compromised or system fail in a cloud environment so enterprise has to analyze all kind of a risk so this consideration may not alter the decision to migrate to the cloud a risk practitioner should also ensure they are include in their decisions so this is the element we need to consider okay so next is basically called as a project management so we have several risk associate with the project management also what is the difference between the project and program so project is basically uh, uh, a time bound activity which has a start and end date whereas a program is basically a continuous so when you taking example of projects risk you know sometime what happened the project could not able to meet on the defined objectives or you know the failure of one project will affect the other so these are risk we have so uh, we can have a, some kind of a controls by which we can able to mitigate this risk example like you can implement the change control board to prevent the scope creep you can implement or you can prioritize your critical project task to use resource optimally and third most important thing you can reorganize or providing the additional resource to overcome the bottleneck so that is how we can do that and uh, when we having a project close out it should be done in such a manner it should not reveal any informations so there will be some kind of a anticipated points at which deliverables are fully transitioned to user or system support staff and the project is basically closed make sure we should have a proper delivery there and in particular to the project close out post implementation or after review also required which help us to allow the identification and capture of the lesson learn and that can be used to improve the future projects so stakeholder satisfaction should be considered as a part of a process however the projects are typically undertaken for the benefit of the sponsor so accordingly verifying the sponsor satisfaction with outcome is for a particular is important so closer procedure are often standardized within the large enterprise and according to that we try to validate the goal the next part is called as a enterprise resiliency see resiliency basically mean able to continue in the case of disaster that is basically called as a resiliency so we have a two aspect in the enterprise resiliency one is called bcp and one is called dr plan so business continuity plan is all about continue the business in the case of disaster okay or how to sustain business in the case of disaster that is called bcp so that's why if you can see here it is clearly mentioned documentation of a predetermined set of instructions or procedure that describe how the organization mission business process will be sustained during and after significant disruption 
whereas a dr plan is a return plan for recovering one or more information system at an alternate facility so one example is uh, when you're talking about this is the site one we have okay and we have a site two so we have a spare site also okay so currently all the service are basically uh, offer from the site one to the customer so 40 server load is basically happening on the site one so in the case of disaster we shift to site two we shift to site three example so it is like a backup site for site one but problem is that it is only having a 20 servers so 40 server load shift to 20 server definitely it impact the performance so this cannot provide me a very stable solution so here i basically perform the dr I'm trying to recover from the disaster which is happening on the site one and try to up the site two. So after a particular point of time, I can continue my service from the site two. So here I perform the DR. Here it was a contingency plan and overall these are included in the BCP plan. One more example I can give here is suppose you are part of my online training and we are doing a training from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So that is basically the time of the training we have 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Now what happened during a 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. there was a power failure. So I switched to UPS. So switching to UPS part of my contingency plan calling a alliteration repair that part of my DR. So all these activity work together because by end of the day what I need I need to continue my session from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. without any downtime. So this is basically part of the BCP and DR. So these plans are basically work together to continue the service in the case of disaster. So BCP is the strategic plan. DR is basically the IT plan which talk about how to continue and how to recover the IT service in the case of disaster. They primarily address the availability aspect of the CIA. So question is how the BCP works. So, so now we're going to understand how to create a BCP plan in the organization. So here what I did, I have taken the reference of NIST and because that, that give the better visibility about how the BCP works from a serious point of view, you don't need to know what are the steps we need to perform in BCP, but it is basically, uh, just for a reference I have added in this particular slide, but it is good to have basic understanding. So whenever any kind of a BCP or any kind of a system you want to introduce in the organization, any system, the first important thing you need to understand, you need to have a policy for that because policy set the governance, policy set the clarity, policies talk about why we need this. Same like in India, when the GST system was introduced, it was backed and supported by the GST law. Same like any kind of a system, any kind of a program you want to introduce in the organization it should be backed and supported by the policy because policy approval is like a senior management approval for the system so that is why if you notice here the first step in the bcp is the develop the contingency pol policy and once you're done with the policy then you basically move to the next part which is called as a bia now definitely we know in the case of disaster it is not possible for us to protect everything it is not possible for us to restore the all the service on the same time. So we need to prioritize what is important, what is not. And for that reason, we basically have a BIA. So BIA stands for business impact analysis. It is a process by which we're trying to identify the criticality of the business. We try to identify what we need to restore first. Okay, what need to be restored and what need to be ignored in the case of disaster. So BIA helped me with that particular information. So to perform the BIA, so we need a business owners. So we will contact the business owner first. One, two, three, four. So we have a business owners here. So I will basically schedule the meeting with business owners. So as a BCP coordinator. So I schedule the meeting with all the business owners and I try to understand what is the business they have. Then try to understand the revenue generated by the business. And then I try to understand their acceptable downtime. Do they have any kind of acceptable downtime? Once I basically understand the acceptable downtime, I also try to understand what are the assets are basically support that particular business. What are the servers? What are the applications we have which support the business? And then I will try to identify the threat associated with the servers. We try to identify the vulnerability associated with the servers. And then I try to identify the impact. Okay, if it's down for two hours, what is the impact? If it's down for three hours, what is the impact? So that clarity we get in the BIA. 
so now understood that okay business one want a maximum downtime of one hour they want two hour they want three hour they want four hour example so according to that i will basically prepare the contingency strategy okay for this business we need a hot side for this business we need a cold side for this business we need a redundant side i will submit the plan to the management management will basically approve that and then based on that we create a full fledged dr plan make sure plan is working correctly and effectively we basically test the plan and finally we basically update the plan based on the need of the business so this is how the entire bcp work in the organization so from a serious point of view we need to focus more on the bia so as i said in bia the first step is identify the business process because we need to identify the criticality sensitivity of the business how critical is the business for the organization how much revenue is basically generating by the business that is basically part of the business process then we identify the resources which is necessary to keep the process running so i scheduled the meeting with my colleague his name is krish so i asked him boss you have a critical business you have this servers okay how critical is the server for this uh, for this business process it's very critical if the server is down everything is down oh wow so you want me to protect this servers yes i want this servers to be protected and i want to ensure the servers must be up and running to support my business function and do let me know what additional resources are required by which i can able to contain the business in the case of disaster so that is something we identify in this step then i'm trying to determine three element here mtd rto and rpo okay mtd rto and rpo so first we try to understand the mtd maximum tolerable downtime it mean acceptable downtime that is agreed with the customer okay it is always determined by the business owner second is basically called as a rto rto is all about the time it take to restore the services that is basically called as a rto and rpo is basically talk about the recovery point objective it mean the acceptable data loss in the case of disaster again it will be basically tell by the business owner only so let's take up an example so if you notice here suppose this is the mtd that is agreed with the customer is 4 hour okay and now we have a server here server was basically working since 7 am in the morning it is up since morning 7 am and it work well till 9 am it work till 11 work fine suddenly what happened server was basically down server was down at 11:15 server was down at 11:15 okay so according to mtd the server need to be up by 3 so rto is the value which is determined based on the mtd so if mtd basically say 4 hour i will set the rto which is less than 4 hour which is called 3 hour because ultimate goal of a bcp is rto should be less than mtd so what i did i try to restore the service by 250 so that the effort i took to restore that is my rto but because if it exceed by 3 then it will be an inoperable loss for the business and in that case client will not going to uh, handle any kind of a thing and they will basically enforce a penalty clause on that so we need to protect against the financial risk and all that so we need to make sure the server need to be restored before the 3 pm of the ist so here by 2 pm i was able to restore the server that is basically my rto so rto is less than mtd now third point is basically called as a rpo rpo is basically called as a acceptable data loss so here i am keeping a rpo suppose 2 hour it mean maximum data loss that i can able to support or suffer maximum is 2 hour so it mean according to 2 hour every 2 hour we need to take a backup 7 am we took the first backup which is called 1.1 the second backup we have taken at 1.2 which is at 9 am then version 1.3 at 11:15 server was down so the 2:15 when i restore the server the last backup i was restored that is called 1.3 so in this case 15 minutes of data loss we have suffered because after 11:15 there is no operation happen and if there is no operation happen there is no data was generated the last backup which was taken was the 11 am which is basically called as a 1.3 what is the maximum we have agreed is 2 hour in this case what is the maximum we have faced loss is basically 15 minutes 
So this MTD, RTO and RPO will be determined by the MTD and RPO determined by the business owner. So we will capture all this information in the BIA report. Okay, the business process one has a MTD four hour. The business two basically has a MTD of three hour. The business three basically have a MTD of two hour. So if I fail to restore in two hour, it has a high impact. If I fail to restore in three hour, it has an impact. If I restore, fail to restore in four hour, it is an impact. So according to that, I will prepare the DR plan. Then I had to, based on this BIA, I need to identify the priority and we need to plan the further things. That is where the BIA is a very important thing. Now, this is all about the resiliency. So MTD, RTO, RPO is very important for the series exam. So you must prepare this element thoroughly. Now, next thing is basically called as a data life cycle management. So the goal of data, goal of effective data management is to ensure the data is incorporated, protected according to its value. Okay. At all the time in all location, including the data at rest, data in transit or data in process. Because when we're talking about data state, we have a three state of data. One is called as a data at rest. One is basically called data in transit and one is called as a data in use. Like data at rest means it's resides somewhere in a storage. So we maintain the security data in transit mean we're sending a data from A to B. So we need to maintain the security data in use basically mean right now I'm running a PPT with the help of memory. I'm able to run this PPT that is called data in use. So we have to use some kind of a control to protect the data from the unauthorized disclosure. We need to protect the data from unauthorized data exfiltration. What is data exfiltration? So data should not leave the enterprise network. So data is within the enterprise network. Make sure it should not leave in an unauthorized manner. Like there is a hacker. He sent a phishing email. The person has clicked on the link and it create a reverse connection. And through that reverse connection, we can send the data. So we need to restrict the movement of data. And that is where the DLP come into the picture. So DLP is called as a data loss prevention a solution which is used to protect the data from exfiltration. So these are basically the element we have. So, but when you're talking about the DLP, the DLP is basically work in a two way. One is called network based DLP. And one is basically called as an endpoint DLP. Okay. Network based DLP and one is called as an endpoint DLP example, like mm, we have a switch. Okay, so this is basically my network based DLP. And then we have a system A, we have a system B, and we have a system C. So in each system, we basically install the endpoint DLP. Okay, so user is trying to browse website and all that. So he trying to establish a connection with the external server. So there is a possibility data can be lived by this way, but network based DLP is there. We try to block the data. So it is a solution which is installed to ensure the data should not leave in an unauthorized manner, but there is a possibility user is disconnected from the network and connecting a pen drive and trying to copy the data. So there is an endpoint DLP installed in the system, which prevent from copying that particular data clear. So ultimate goal of the DLP is to ensure protecting of the data. Okay. Now we have some risk associated with the emerging technologies and one of the emerging technology is blockchain. So blockchain is a distributed ledger, distributed database or ledger that is shared among the nodes of the computer network. Today, blockchain is used everywhere. It is used in a finance vertical. It is used in a manufacturing. It is used in a product. So this allow maintaining a timeline of the transaction, allow the history of data to determine without centralized processing. And that can also be the risk because there is no central party to manage a thing. So that basically bring the risk. There is no uniformity in that. That is basically bring the risk. If someone modify the transaction, updating a transaction that lead to the integrity issue. So that is as a risk we have with adopting of this emerging technology, which is called as a blockchain. So today blockchain is best known for their crucial role in cryptocurrency system such as Bitcoin for maintaining a secure and decentralized record of transactions. So wherever there is a decentralized mean there is no centralized authority to manage that. So it bring automatically the new risk toward the organization. So we need to analyze all the risk associated with emerging technology before implementing in the enterprise. Now, next thing is basically called as an authentication factor in every organization. Whenever we deal with access control, we basically have a three important element. One is called as a 
identification one is called as a authentication and one is basically called as a authorization so we have a three type of element in access management so example like this is the gmail username and password forum so what you enter in the username and they verify whether username exists in the database that is called identification process of verifying the id in the database then you type password in the password box to claim that yes the person who claimed to be the same person that is called as a authentication and then we basically allocate a specific resources to them that is called as a authorization let's take an example of the airport you go to the airport and say hey my name is prab and i'm traveling from trivandrum to delhi they will check my name in the passenger list they just confirm yes your name in the list so that is the identification but they want to verify is it the same prab so they ask my aadhar card they ask my passport which can validate i am prab nair so by this way they called as a authentication they give me the seat number that is a authorization so when we talking about the authentication here we have a three type of authentication something you know which is your password what you enter something you have which is a token or ticket rsa token and all that or otp value that you receive on your smart uh, on your smartphone and something you are which is called your biometric in order to establish the strong accountability in the organization it is great to have a multi factor authentication strong authentication drive the strong accountability in the data center if you want a appropriate accountability to be established implement the multi layer authentication multi factor authentication because tomorrow he, they should not deny that it was not him who accessed the thing someone has accessed my password someone has stolen my card so he cannot say that okay someone has stolen my fingers to for authentication right so by something you are you showing their presence of the person in that location that is why the stronger authentication come from the multi factor now next thing is basically called as a cryptography so there is a dedicated video i made on cryptography so you can check that in serious exam you need to have a high level understanding about the cryptography so cryptography is basically uh used is a services it's a technology it's a concept which is used to protect the data so it is a science of writing a data in a secret text science of writing data in a secret text is called as a cryptography so in cryptography we basically have a multiple standard so we have a two type of cryptography currently one is called symmetric and one is called as a asymmetric symmetric basically use the same key by which they encrypt and decrypt the data if it is a asymmetric they use one key to encrypt and one key to decrypt the data so we use this cryptography together which is called as a hybrid cryptography because symmetric cryptography use for generating a key and asymmetric is used for the key exchange i repeat I, i repeat again there is a dedicated video i made on how symmetric asymmetric works so make sure you can check that hash standard or hashing standard is used for achieving the integrity and digital signature basically offer the authenticity and integrity to the documents so this is basically part of the cryptography okay so it is very important for you to also understand the different risk associate in the sdlc sdlc basically stand for software development life cycle okay so sdlc is a fundamentally a methodology which is intended to support the effective project management and there are numerous approaches to manage the projects okay however many core principle are same even when particular style of showing the considerable difference so proper oversight and clear requirement user involvement communication between the team member and user and regular review of project progress are all the critical to the project success okay so here you can see the first step is initiation where you schedule the meeting with the customer understand his requirement okay and understand end to end everything then during this phase we also design the application and documenting what is the functional requirement we need in the application then we basically try to develop the application and then we try to implement the application after obtaining the authorization then we maintaining the application and when the application meet his life span and all that we basically dispose the application make sure we should risk do the risk assessment in every phase when we having a meeting with the stakeholder make sure we understand the requirement correctly make sure we have captured the requirement correctly make sure all the risk has been addressed properly so that is a risk perspective during a development adopting a secure coding standard make sure there should not be any risk associated on the coding level developers will get at proper access no others others should not have a access to the area so that's something risk we need to review during a implementation the software should develop as per the business requirement 
it should be implemented as per the business objective it should not produce any kind of errors so that is a risk associated with the implementation maintenance and disposal is the next important part we have so we need to understand from a risk practitioner perspective about the risk associate in all the projects risk associate in all the phases so risk practitioner will often find the project at risk of failure and it should be able to identify the cause of those failures and recommend the solution report risk to the management so this was a part a in the part b we talk about the information security principles so in the information security principle the first part we need to understand the awareness okay so when you're talking about awareness before going to understand awareness we need to understand thin line difference between the awareness training and education so when we're talking about uh, uh awareness awareness is basically a short term awareness is a short term training is a mid term and education is a long term example like I was in an impression the eight character password is a secure password. So I was using one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I attended the awareness workshop conducted by my team member, and I got to know alpha numeric and special is considered as eight character. So this is something which modify my behavior. I used to share my password with my family, friends, and all that. After attending the awareness workshop, I got to know I should not supposed to share my password. This is how they modifying my behavior. second is basically called as a training training is basically introduced to modify the skill right now i am an auditor i upgraded in c risk by attending a particular training for 5 days and i become a risk practitioner so that is how i modify my profile so that is called as a training attending a college workshops or college two year degree program which changed my entire career that is called as an education one more example i can give you from a physical security point of view I have attended. I'm at. I. 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 Uh, my company has sponsored my two-year diploma program for understanding a physical security of data center. So they sent me to college to understand that. That is education. Training the marshal in every floor. That is called as a training. How to combat the fire. How to evacuate people and all that. That's called marshal training. And drill training. Fire drill training, which is happening every six months. That is called as a awareness. But the question is how to review the effectiveness of the awareness program. and why in the c risk we are focusing more on the awareness section see awareness is introduced to modify the behavior of the people who are the weakest link in the organization the weakest link in the organization is a human and the best way to mitigate that weakness is providing them the awareness training but the question is that how you can propose how can you sure that this awareness training or awareness workshop is great before awareness we used to report 70 incidents we used to receive 70 incident but after the awareness training we receive 140 there is a 100% growth in that there is a 50% growth in that sorry so increase in the incident report signify the people are now more mature about those issues okay they able to identify those issues and that's why they able to report immediately to the incident management team so increased in the incident report and decrease in a security violation that is the best way you can able to measure the awareness training of the company is it clear so that is that is how you can able to validate so familiarity with the technology that people bring to their workplace may reduce operation training cost and helps to boost the productivity but it also create a risk the barrier to entry into the computing workforce have fallen so have a barrier to become a cyber threat actor so from a script from a script credi who mine the action of professional penetration testers as a way of gaining experience to the part time dabblers in corporate espionage and all the way of foreign intelligence assets who have been recruited to launch cyber attack from the inside national border is a common thing so it's very important train people train force so they can able to protect the organization from all kind of attacks now next thing is basically called as a privacy data privacy is a new section which is added in the c risk syllabus it was not there in the previous so question is what is the difference between privacy and secrecy privacy versus secrecy privacy deal with the individual like my pi data and all that and secrecy deal with the organization data like trade secret and all that so we have a different regulations like us has their regulation for their particular sector like for health sector they have a hipaa okay for the finance they have a glba 
if you're talking about europe they have a privacy regulation which is called gdpr canada has a pibda so there's a lot of regulation was created to protect the data privacy of an individual so one of the first principle in the data privacy is called as a informed consent so data subject to privacy regulation should be collected used retained with the informed consent of the subject example my company infosec and driving some kind of a webinars so we are collecting your email address because we need to send you the invite but it is very important for me to give you the awareness about why we are collecting your information without notifying you collecting information is a spy same like when you go to the bank or anywhere you can see it is mentioned this area is under cctv if they don't notify that and without that they doing a monitoring it is called as a spy so signed consent form is typically part of the process but may not unto into itself to establish the informed consent so in addition there may be need to process for the revocation of the consent second we talking about the pia privacy impact assessment it is a process by which we analyzing a level of privacy they need in the system okay so organization conduct the pia to identify manage the risk related to the privacy whenever the personal information has been collected and when you talking about the pia typically cover how the information is going to use shared and maintain similar to risk assessment pia account for the effect of compromise on the subject rather than impact on the enterprise so risk practitioner dealing with the data subject to privacy regulation should be familiar with the pia conducted prior to collecting a data as a first step toward ensuring the adequate protective measures are in place one of the best way you can limit your liability from any kind of a regulation issue is minimization limit in the collection of a data because more you collect more accountability comes to you you are scheduling a webinar better just maintain the email address and name you mentioning about the mandate to fill the phone number mandate to fill the house address more you collect more accountability comes to you more you need to manage the security for that it's better the best way we can reduce the impact is limit in the collection of a data that is the most effective way you can able to protect your organization from all the regulatory issues and all that and last is basically called as a destruction when data is not in use properly destroy, destroy the data so by this way you can able to protect yourself from all kind of a liability issue so this is all from my side in the series domain 4 if you Uh, if you find this domain video useful do share your suggestions in the comment box and do check my domain 1 domain 2 domain 3 video also might be this can be helpful for your series exam preparation thank you for watching my video i'm also planning to conduct one session i'm doing one uh, weekend session on series which is starting from the november if you're looking for the class and uh, and you looking for some kind of a hands on experience on how the enterprise risk management work with serious with a good assurance of passing then you can enroll in my class which i'm scheduling in the month of october last week or november you can contact the infosec train for the details and if you still not subscribe to my channel do subscribe to my youtube channel and click on the bell icon to make sure you should not miss my future updates thank you